Welcome to the next Pivot Point podcast. This season, I am focused on sharing stories and ideas from global experts on diversity and inclusion. My purpose is to share diverse stories so that you can learn from others' lived experiences and walk away with actionable strategies to lead even more inclusively. I share this information because inclusive leadership is a journey. It requires bravery and courage, and you do not have to do it alone. At Next Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together as allies. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome to this week's episode of the Next Pivot Point podcast. I'm excited to be joined with our guest expert, Robert Gibson. He has been helping people to navigate cultures for over 30 years. This includes being responsible for intercultural competence development in multinational corporations and teaching cross-cultural management at the Bologna Business School in Italy. He was recently part of a project team which designed and implemented an unconscious bias initiative for over 200. 30,000 employees worldwide. Oh, can't wait to learn more about that. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Julie. Great to talk to you. It's, I'm really thrilled to be talking to you and what a depth of expertise you have. And the part of your bio that really stuck out to me is navigating different cultures. How, you know, how did you get into this work and what is it like to teach people how to navigate different cultures? Yeah, okay. Um, How did I get into it? I mean, uh, it goes back a long way, I suppose, without telling you my life story. But I I grew up in London, which is, as as you know, very diversity, uh, probably one of the most diverse in in Europe, and got very interested in cultures. I had actually, and I think this is important for people, how influential teachers can be. I had a very, very good uh, German teacher. So I got into German. I decided to study German uh, language and literature at university and history. And before that, I went to, I had a couple of stages where I got into cultural things. One was before I went to university, I I lived in West Berlin, which was at that time divided city of Berlin. So I was faced with living in a foreign culture as a British person in Germany, but also in a city which had two political systems, which were quite different. And that was fascinating for me. My West German hosts didn't understand why I wanted to keep going to East Berlin. They said, why did you go there? It's terrible. And I said, well, it's, I met people there and I found it very, very interesting. Uh, then I, later on, I got a bit interested in Central and Eastern Europe. I, I taught English a little bit in, in the holidays in, in Poland in, for UNESCO, for the United Nations uh, Education Programme. And there, of course, I fell in love with a Polish girl. And, um, and I remember going to her house. In Warsaw, I was very, very uh, anxious about what was going on and uh, a little bit nervous, of course, meeting the family for the first time. The grandma opened the door and she put out a hand and um, I, my brain was working overtime, of course, and thinking, how do I behave? My father said, you must um, never have a handshake like a wet fish. You must have a firm handshake. And so I gave her this really hard handshake and and her smile disappeared and, and she just looked a bit irritated. And my, my girlfriend said, why did you do that? And I said, well, what did I do? And she said, well, you, you know what you did. And I said, well, I, I shook her hand. That's the problem. And, uh, and I realized that actually she'd been expecting me to kiss her hand. This was a common thing in older generation, particularly in Poland at the time. And that was a very trivial maybe incident, but those things amounted up to saying, okay, realizing as a young person, these cultural political things, they are important and they shape your life. And and then I got various jobs where I could get involved with this area. And I started really with the area of of what the German call Landeskunde, which is cultural studies. Uh, It was actually quite boring teaching about the American constitution and the British parliament and the Magna Carta, uh, feeding the students with these facts. And I thought it doesn't have to be so boring. How can I make it more interesting? And I found actually a lot of things were going on in industry and business. And I started getting into that. And later on, I was fortunate to work in a company um, where I was then in charge of uh, intercultural training and consultancy. And it was there that I discovered the idea of navigating cultures because many of my clients wanted these sort of quick fix solutions. I don't know if you've come across those sorts of people, but (laughs) yeah, those are the people who say to me, they ring up and say, I'm going to China next week. Uh, Can you send me a list of do's and don'ts? You know, and I would say, um, well, we have a 
a three-day course about China. No, no, I don't have time for that. Or we can do one day coaching for you. Well, no, 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 that's too much too long. I just need an A4 sheet of do's and don'ts for China. So I ended up getting quite sarcastic and saying, well, okay, you send me one for Germany and I'll send you one for China. Oh, well, Germany is very, very complex. You can't just summarize Germany on one page. You, it's, uh, we have regions and, uh, and uh, you, you've, you've obviously no idea. And then I, I would put the phone down and then they would complain to the HR about my being uncooperative. <laughs> and, um, basically, it was this idea of quick fix of do's and don'ts of lists of cultural characteristics and then I, uh, with the, my colleagues, we came up with the idea of actually what people need is not a list, but a navigation system, a way of finding your way around the complexity of cultural differences. And then later, I'll tell you later on about how I got into diversity, but this was my, the foundation perhaps. Of, of oh, that's fun. That's really, a really good point is, yeah, so you tell me how, how you'd put your culture on one page <laughs> and then people, I think we always think where we're at is more complicated than where other people are at. I don't know how many times they hear that from organizations. Well, our organization, our industry is really complex. You don't, you know, <laughs> like I've spent time in your industry and I've spent time in this industry and they're pretty much the same. Um, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, cultural differences are very vast, very nuanced. Um, it takes time to immerse yourself in a culture. And I like for quick fixes versus long-term like navigation systems that are more strategic and all-encompassing and honor the culture. Uh, so that's a really cool contrast. And I, I think I can borrow that with my, I get a lot of requests for quick fix diversity training. And I'm always like, no. The same there. Yeah, it's probably too. I, I can imagine that that happens with, uh, with, with diversity. Okay, tell me how this group then, uh, how they behave. How are, the, how are they? You know? Yeah. Well, and come in and talk about race. Like, okay. Like that is a very complex topic. Yeah, yeah. And if you haven't laid the groundwork and talked about other foundational topics about why this matters and what it means to us and how we're going to go about this, that makes it a really hard way to achieve anything in, in an hour or two. And certainly even in your day long <laughs> programs or you know, three days, I'm curious, tell us more about those programs. Like what do you teach when you're teaching people how to navigate different cultures? What does that look like? Yes. I mean, there are, there are, I try to use, um, visual things. I like these sort of metaphors for that. And there's all sorts of metaphors about culture. Um, and one is, um, yeah, I'm talking really about attitudes, shared attitudes and beliefs and behavior that people have in a group. And I think uh, at the beginning, when I first started uh, into this about 30 years ago, we were talking really about national groups. And, and then we realized actually, it's not just national groups. People are multi-collective. We have then regional identity. We have a, a identity according to our gender, our professional background. I found that very, very important working in the large corporation, how different these professional backgrounds were amongst people. The software architects, they worked very happily together with people from different national cultures, but they had big problems with the hardware people. So they said, well, we don't talk to them. And I said, oh, but you talk to your Indians and your Chinese. Like, oh, that works very well, but not with the hardware or, or with HR or with a customer or whatever. Yeah? So there's all sorts of different types of culture. And I think the, so I stress to people, it's like a cocktail. We, we have to think about the individual. What is this individual's background? If you're dealing with somebody, that's very important but also about um, the culture in, uh, in a multidimensional way. So uh, not just national culture, but all these other types of cultural difference, which are very similar to the diversity dimensions. As I say, it could be age or gender or uh, physical ability, whatever. And the other element, which is very, very important, I think is the situational element of this, which we try to stress is to say, you're gonna, people are different in different situations. So, um, as somebody once said to me, you don't kiss the customer. Unfortunately, I had a French guy in the room and he said, well, in France, we do actually kiss the customer. Uh, but uh, you behave differently at home from what you do in the office, what you do with a client. And you behave differently in a different context. If you're under big pressure to get the deal, you're going to behave differently from if it's like yeah, um, a seller's market or something like this and you, you don't need it. So um, we try to... In the training that I do, then we try to simulate this through experiential learning. So there's a certain amount of information, but it's all about really people becoming aware of their own 
reactions to situations, finding out what their hotspots are there, which trigger them. And we all have those, you know, we have those things which irritate us enormously. I hated it in Germany when people said, my boss would say, you must do that. And I thought, no way am I going to do that. And of course he was quite right. It was my job to do that. And he didn't mean it badly, but I took it, no, no, I'm uh -huh. I'm Rob Gibson. I'm not going to be told what to do. By <laughs> yeah. He must. And he thought, why is he reacting like this? So we have the, those trigger points, which people have to discover. And it's a question, I think, of creating situations through maybe case study or role play, or whatever, uh, which help people to suddenly get this aha effect. Oh, wow. I didn't realize why did I react like that uh, to this uh, to this situation. So using that cocktail, the content, of course, is also uh, a number of different factors, which I think you have to bear in mind if you're dealing with different cultures. It might be the communication style, it might be the attitude to hierarchy, it might be the attitude to space, time. These are quite abstract concepts, but we try to make it practical with examples of these sorts of things. Mm, um, I love that. I love that. It reminds me of my time when I was in grad school, I had the opportunity to spend four months abroad as an American. I'd never been across, you know, to a very different culture. I've been to Canada, you know, Mexico, that kind of the Caribbean, but I'd never been to like a very different country. And when I landed in Paris in 2010, I remember just being shell-shocked of like, everything is so different here and <laughs> I don't fit in. And you know, it just, it, it, over the course of the four months, what I learned about just observing, and I think that's what you're talking about, knowing your own trigger points, observing the other culture and just kind of assimilating. I would have friends come to visit me several months in and they were very loud. Like our voices as Americans are very much louder. <laughs> um, they would drink a lot more like the, the alcohol consumption is very different <laughs> in Europe. And it was, it was, just, and, and the impatience factor that we had, um, that I had kind of learned, I had learned to quiet those things about myself and blend in. Um, but it took me a long time and it was really uncomfortable at first to have to adjust things about myself that I thought to be kind of normal and yep. Yep. had yep. been that way for many, many years. Uh, so it, it's, it's great. I think one of the lenses I talk about a lot in diversity is people that have traveled globally tend to have a much more of a healthy appetite towards diversity because they've seen it and they've seen it's not scary and that other people, we actually have a lot more in common from a values yeah. perspective, even if they look different than us and behave different than us, like we're still human beings at the core. I think that, that uh, to me, when people ask me quite often, what does, what does it mean to be culturally competent? And one of the things that we come up with is what you describe is curiosity, actually, mm -hmm. is um, being interested in things and not expecting things to be simple, expecting complexity and ambiguity to, to know that you won't know any situation. For me, I mean, more um, this happened when I, um, like I mentioned to you, my wife is Chinese. So we met in the company in Germany, but our wedding was in China and we go to China quite a lot. And China was not a country that I really was involved with. I was quite confident about navigating uh, European cultures, but then I find myself going to China for my wedding and as an intercultural expert, and uh, and you've got jet lag and you've got diarrhea and you've got and it's your wedding and you're supposed to be happy and and but you're faced with situations where you have no idea what's going on at all. Um, I actually ordered some books before we got married. Um, how does Chinese women tick and so forth and. Uh, unfortunately, my wife um, discovered these books and she she's an engineer and she said, um, what are you looking for? An operating manual for me. And uh, I realized the limitation of these books because nothing in the books, they, they give you this sense of security. You think, oh, now I know. But then you find actually it has nothing to do with this at all. And uh, and every time I'm surprised by things, I just have to think, OK, I just have to accept that I have no idea what's happening here. We are at a dinner party and with the family and suddenly we leave and I have no idea what happened. I don't understand what's going on because I don't speak Chinese. And I have to ask my wife later on, well, why did we suddenly leave? You know, and why did everybody just stand up and walk out? Did we have a big row or was this normal? <laughs> or, <everything> okay? <laughs> is it OK? Are we still talking? You know, so I think that's a very key thing is being and, and as you've stressed a lot, I think I like it in your um, TED talk that I watched uh, this not putting people into boxes and saying, oh, I know. 
uh, this is what women are like or strong women or strong men or whatever, or this is what Chinese are like or what British are like or Americans, or whatever. That is, I think, extremely irritating for people. And um, it's not helpful for, for, for getting on with people. You have to get break out of these boxes and sort of de-box uh, people. And mm -hmm. I think that applies in the, in the business world when you're actually assessing people and developing people, not to think because this person never says something at a meeting that they're going to be uh, not good as a manager or something. Right. You can put them in that box, uh, which I... I saw quite a lot happening, you know, and um, very simple things, apparently, you know, and you say, well, why didn't you promote this guy? He's, he's brilliant. Well, he never says anything in the meeting. Okay, so you want someone who talks at meetings? Is that the job description? Is that the criteria <laughs> we're working with? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, Robert, everything you're saying, I, I, I totally identify with like how our brains really like categories. <laughs> and yeah. so like, it's this or it's that, like you're Chinese yeah. or you're this culture, you know, and to your point, people are much more complex, right? There's, there's yeah. obviously cultural complexity and there's context um, and cultural norms that have been around for a very long time that people naturally adopt. So I'm curious about the global differences. So as a practitioner of diversity here in the United States, I work with a lot of global companies that are say, okay, yeah, you, your American version's okay, but can you take out, like I just had a client last night, can you take out slide 10 and 11 and make them more global? And I was like, hmm, yes, uh, this is very US focused and something like race in particular is very, um, and gender yeah. differences too globally um, are different. But I'm curious, as somebody that's rolled out training globally, yeah. How does the diversity conversation, how does the training need to change as you work in a more global environment? That's, that's to me a very, very big question that we were confronted with with this project that you mentioned was a, was a big, uh, which I was involved with, this big rollout to, we reached 230,000 people in many different countries, was how to create then materials that could be suitable or even acceptable or even legal in different countries. Um, so we were faced with, we, we wanted to have a very strong element about um, LGBTQ and so forth. We wanted the sexual orientation to be a topic, but then we were faced with some countries where actually this would be uh, actually illegal to do this. And there was an ethical discussion, of course, about this. Well, maybe we should just stick to our principles, but we had to come up with a more modular approach where the countries themselves decided, uh, we created like a, a toolbox, we called it a global uh, unconscious bias toolbox and the people could um, mix modules from this toolbox to suit their environment. Um, so that, yeah, what comes across some of the concepts are alien to people. We have to accept that in some cultures, diversity is not necessarily seen as a positive. So uh, they may say, well, actually our strength is that we don't have diversity, that we're homogenous. Um, or they have a different idea of diversity or there are different issues. Um, I mean, when we were doing work in China, we found actually that the issue which was very important in Germany of gender equality, which was one of the drivers, was actually not such a big issue in, this was a Western company active in China, that in these Western companies, there were a lot of um, female managers in very senior positions. And um, it was not the same, um, the same ball game as it would be in, uh, in Germany where there was a, a big problem with this. So, we had to define yeah, what topics we cover, what these things mean. Even the word diversity um, in Germany is, is, can be a bit problematic. Um, I remember before I joined this company, I was at a management school, a university, and uh, we had a guest lecturer from Cincinnati, and she was an HR expert, and she offered a couple of courses. One was like HR management, and one was diversity. And um, the students were very keen because they wanted to go to courses in English and she was very respected. Um, and she came to me and she said, well, I don't understand what's happening here because I've got 30 students have signed up for my course on HR, that's great, but only two have signed up for diversity. Uh, okay, this was a while ago now, it was 20 years ago, but actually I think there's still the problem there where people didn't quite know, they couldn't know what it means. You can't even translate it really into German. Vielfalt isn't a word or whatever. It's it's. It's a concept, and I think it's, it's a bit of an American construct coming here. So when we were doing this unconscious bias initiative, we actually 
I resisted this to start with, but I was convinced by the end that it was a good idea. We, we changed the title and we called it, actually it was about inclusion and unconscious bias, but we called it making better decisions. And this was an absolute breakthrough because we immediately got everybody on board because we re they recognized that actually this is what a, what a business person does all day. That's what they're paid for. They don't actually manage it and produce anything concrete, but they, they make decisions. And, if, and they thought, okay, if we can help people to make decisions, then that might be interesting. And through this, we in fact got the board members even interested, not just the HR board member who was so, she was interested in it anyway. Uh, she drove the thing, but the, the actual business leaders were saying, okay, we, we, we can go with this. Yeah? So we were recognizing a problem that this was solving rather than trying to make an issue from something that they didn't really know about. Yeah, it, it, it's a great way. And when you lead with the words diversity and inclusion, it, yeah, it's a funny how it's a polarizing word. It feels, you know, the word inclusion especially feels very inclusive to me. Yeah. For diversity, I think, yeah, it's like, oh, creates kind of the zero sum game mentality. If maybe you're white or a man or in, you know, a majority group category, or you feel like you're not quote unquote diverse. So I love this flipping of, well, what's the business problem? Like, what's the problem that this training yeah. is for instead and making it about making better decisions? Well, who yeah. doesn't want to do that, right? And yeah, yeah. first teams make better decisions. 87% of the time, I think was the latest stat I saw on that. So absolutely. Or you could, I mean, you could talk about actually surviving as a business because in the company I was working for, yeah. this initiative that I was involved with about unconscious bias and diversity was basically triggered by a realization of the, the talent flow would, would dry up. Um, there was too many male German engineers who were in the leadership roles. Yeah. And um, they, they, they had a department which looked at, they called it scenarios of the future. They were doing, um, predicting the future. And they said, well, actually, in 10 years time, we won't have enough of these people. Yep. Um, they, not because we want to be nice to anybody else, but basically we want our business. Many workers. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a romantic thing at all. Uh, it's a hard business thing. Mm -hmm. So I found myself like you've done, I know, trying to think of hard business arguments. And I'm very mm -hmm. grateful to those people who've done this work to show how important it is if you want to be innovative, mm -hmm. um, if you want to uh, attract and keep talent, if you want to be, if you want to have this customer proximity, then you need um, to have a diverse workforce and you need also to keep that workforce. I think the other thing that I found was that we were attracting a lot of people but then they were leaving. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was doing onboarding for them and then thought, wow, this is amazing. We've got a Brazilian aeronautical engineer as a woman and she's wow. Actually, she's still there. She's now a CEO of one of the companies, but she's amazing. But um, some of them were these people who we attracted, but they left after two years and you saw them on LinkedIn. Now X has been appointed to another rival company. Mm -hmm. And because not enough... I just didn't meet enough retention managers. I, I met a lot of talent acquisition managers. Huh? Um, maybe, I guess, maybe it's different in the States. Is it, is it no, it, yeah. it, it's the conundrum. Um, yeah. We want to recruit diverse talent. Like, okay, great. Yeah. What are you doing to ensure they want to stay? Yeah. They yeah. start working and, there. And that question, people don't like that question. <laughs> like, no, we're just going to go recruit them. And like, miraculously, they're just going to feel like this is the place they want to be because it's going to be so lucky <laughs> that they got this job. And, and I think it ties back to bias, right? It yeah. ties back to inclusive behaviors in the workplace. And if you don't have a culture of inclusion, um, you're likely to lose diverse talent at a much higher rate. So a lot mm -hmm. of my companies that have shared data with me is generally a two to three X higher rate uh, with people of color and with women yeah. leaving the workforce than the white male majority group. And, and why is that, right? And, you know, I think we use excuses sometimes of like, well, they just weren't a good fit. Um, and I always like to unpack what that means because it's usually biased. Um, or, you know, a woman, she has caretaking responsibilities. Well, what are we doing to make yeah, sure she feels yeah. included, right? And yeah. so it's all these excuses. I think we just take those excuses. And sometimes you don't even hear the real reasons um, because no one's going to be honest in an exit interview. There's no reason to do that. Um, so if you're not asking people and creating a culture of inclusion, like, yeah, it, it's, you're, you're probably going to get much more frustrated with that higher turnover rate uh, associated yeah. with diverse group, which brings me to a question, Robert, um, you know, unconscious bias training, you've, yeah. you've rolled out this huge initiative. So I'm just curious, 
do you think unconscious bias training works? <laughs> because it's one of those hot topics. Like there's so uh, much data to show it can have a backlash effect, but obviously you're rolling out successful programs. Like tell us what you think. That's right. I mean, I, I was a bit shocked when I recently posted something on LinkedIn about this and um, because there've been a couple of political decisions in UK and USA about uh, it's all been proved to be wrong. We get rid of it. And I, I referred to this and everybody was asking me, what do you think about this? And they were quoting this research, okay, this training with the uh, implicit association test doesn't have any effect and it can be negative. And I thought, first of all, I thought, well, actually, uh, has anybody proven that any training really, uh, any soft skills training has any effect? I'm not sure you can debunk anything you want if you like to. Secondly, what are you expecting from this? Are you expecting you put people in a room for two hours and you sort of brainwash them and suddenly they're clean and, and um, unbiased, you know? This is just nonsense. I mean, um, what I experienced, and probably there's all sorts of different types of unconscious bias training. What I was, what we were doing was actually just making people aware of how their brain works and how it filters, um, how their the filter is, is is determined by their experience and how it filters then the information, which we need to do, as we know, to survive because we can't cope with all those impulses that we get every second. So. Um, when I first did it, I thought this is very, very interesting. And we try to use examples actually, not about people and things, but like about agriculture saying, okay, what happens if you have a monoculture, then it, it can be very uh, short-term, very cost-effective, but long-term it dies out. You need biodiversity. What happens when you taste a glass of wine and you have two bottles and one costs $20 and one five, and you know that beforehand, you, the $20 tastes better because uh, the brain has already decided. What happened when I was a school teacher in Britain and I saw kids called Darren or Wayne, I thought they're going to be trouble. They sit at the front of the class because I had a bias against anybody called Darren or Wayne. I mean, why should Darren or Wayne have anything? Those poor Darrens and Waynes who went to my lessons, you know, they suffered because of my bias. Um, and that's what people are suffering with their CV. If they have a, as the BBC proved in this research with a Arab sounding name and a, a so-called classic English name, um, the the uh, the English guy got uh, three times as many interviews and so forth. Wow. So I think it's about, uh, I think um, we have to make sure we have the right expectations about unconscious bias training. It's not a quick fix either, uh, just as those cultural do's and don'ts are not quick fixes. Um, it's part of a process and it has to be embedded in a whole program. Um, uh, I don't have to tell you this because I know that's what you're doing, but it's really, and this is what we tried to do. It wasn't just training, but it's also about looking at processes and structures in an organization. It's also about communication. So we had three columns to our program. One was training um, and where we had online training and face-to-face -face training. Sometimes it was quite extensive training. Sometimes it was very short. And then we had a whole program of looking at all the processes, uh, particularly in, we started with HR recruiting process, for instance, and saying, okay, how far are these, uh, is bias embedded in these processes or how far can we mitigate the bias in the processes? And then we had a communication campaign where we actually, maybe in a bit like your approach to making allies and so forth, finding people who just made a, they had to make a selfie video. And we started with the board members. They have all fun. Were to make a selfie video. Uh, one guy made a video, unfortunately, in his hotel room where his dirty washing was hanging in the cupboard. <laughs> Um, that went viral, of course, because everybody oh, was in the family, but for the wrong reason. But um, basically, it was it was creating this uh, discussion about this topic. So I think when we look at unconscious bias training, we have to be we have to be clear about what the goals of it are, what we're trying to do, what yeah. is realistic, and um, make sure that it's embedded in a whole holistic approach to change within the whole organization. Ultimately, of course, in the whole society and. Yeah. Um, um, but um, so we have to work on all these different levels. I love that. Well, and the, the two things I'm taking away from the conversation is it's uh, there are no quick fixes, <laughs> <laughs> whether it's the one pager of what it's like to go to China versus the unconscious <laughs> bias, one or two hour training, like systems of inequality, years of cultural creation cannot yeah. be learned that quickly. No. We can't unlearn behaviors like bias um, very quickly either. So it has to be consistent has to be intentional. And, and the other thing, you know, thinking about training as a part of an overall change management plan, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Having yeah. communications, having the leadership team engaged and saying why yeah. this is important, what we expect from you yeah. Yeah. as a more holistic rapper. I know some of my clients that have done that created more of a, a structured you know, communication plan with, we're going to do this training. Then we're going to share this article. Then our leadership team is going to talk about this. And it's like, people believe it after they see it like three, four, five, six times. They're like, oh, wow, this isn't going away. This is how we behave here now. And yeah. they start to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think you can have an influence. And if you approach it from this sort of uh, multi-directional approach from that without overdoing it or so forth. And also then, as I said before, using the language of the people, not, not trying to force something on them, but saying, okay, what is their issue? And uh, okay, your issue is getting the right talent. Let's look, start from that point, your issue. And you say, well, okay, if you carry on as you are, then you won't have anybody. Or your issue is getting more uh, innovation. Then you say, okay, then you need maybe to think more about multi- cultural teams and uh, involving people or your issue is retention. So the other element of it, of course, is, is doing more work on measuring things and, and showing the measurability of it, which is very difficult, of course, but I think there's a lot of progress being made with global benchmarking and diversity to say, we need to look at that. We need to, and people, every training, you show a picture of this is the management board. They're all men and white and everything. And, <laughs> right. and uh, but actually to do it a bit more than that, because, what I've experienced is sometimes people start playing around at the very top. So you have a very diverse board, but then the next level down, you've got the same issue. So they haven't done anything then. So you need to say, let's take a snapshot of the whole organization mm -hmm. and find out where we are and show um, some, some progress, how we're improving and measure other things. I mean, my project, we did it through the engagement survey of the employees. How, how did the employees okay, measure behaviors and how, perception. how did they perceive diversity? And, and we did actually have a concrete improvement in the score on that, that people felt uh, yeah. that it was, was more practical and sharing like best practice sharing is also very valuable saying, okay, oh, we can't do this guy's in a wheelchair. We can't employ them. Well, okay, let's see how the other department created a ramp just so you could get in the building and then it was okay or an yeah. office door that opened automatically or whatever it was that was necessary yeah. so having those those positive examples not just beating people up with a stick and saying you're not diverse enough but saying uh, this is actually a positive message and not the sugar-coated messages with the with these uh, pictures of everybody which some people use which are really unrealistic but say these are the real people Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was where this selfie campaign was very good, actually, because we had then people with the real people saying things, you know, and saying, mm -hmm. this is what we do. And this is great. And showing examples of what potential was in people yeah, uh, that was being uh, let loose and saying, OK, you might think this is just a very quiet person, totally introverted, but they uh, they may well be a brilliant manager. I I experienced that all the time in, in mm -hmm. training programs. See, I think this person, my goodness. It's going to be embarrassing. And then they're, you know, and then they're brilliant, you know, and you mm -hmm. I just had to give them a little chance and to show this and it came out. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what makes it all very worthwhile, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun to be surprised. But our brain doesn't like surprises, right? It likes to think it already has it figured out, like you said, with the wine or whatever or the Dwayne's of the world that we've had bad experiences with. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of unlearning all that and, and putting, slowing our brain down so that we can be curious about people so that we can be open to differences and accommodations. And, and sometimes I think we overthink the complexity of this. And when you just take a step back and just listen to learn how much more you can gain. Um, I know I've, I I've learned does, tremendously. Yeah, yeah I, I feel it does in this intercultural area or the diversity area. It does come down to this sort of, uh, it's a bit of an overused word, but the, the, the idea of mindfulness, really, of, of mm -hmm. like I, I say to people, you can't really, uh, they're a bit frustrated when I say to them, you, I don't think you can get to know another culture, but you can get to know yourself. Yep. Um, and because uh, they're thinking, I'm going to learn about this other guy. I said, well, no, you can learn about your reactions. How do you react when someone says you must do this? But, um, uh, and that's to do with this mindfulness. And that requires space and time and that's something that's sometimes difficult for people to find mm -hmm. uh, if they're very very busy and uh, they don't step back and I think that's where also training plays a role I think it's often a, a step out of the daily routine for people to 
take stock of things. And yeah. uh, perhaps that's what's happening now with the lockdown when people perhaps are not racing around so much and traveling and, and things. I found that I for agree. me personally, not going every week to a different country or something, but just, oh my goodness, I'm stuck in this flat and I can't move really. Mm-hmm. Or go to the shops and uh, come back. Um, you have a lot more time to soak in. <laughs> and if you're open to it, you know, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts with my free time to keep my world open yeah. because I'm not getting on airplanes like I used to and yeah. experiencing mm-hmm. it. So finding other ways to experience it. There's no shortage of tools. No, 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 no. And the diversity space either. There's <laughs> a shortage of this. If you get curious to learn more about these topics, it's there's tons of great free resources online. Um, speaking of which, Robert, um, and kind of wrapping up today, yeah. how can our listeners get in touch with you? How can they follow your work or places you might point listeners to learn more? Um, yeah, I mean the uh, the place where you can get uh, get me best is is via LinkedIn. I would say uh, that's where I'm most active. So I post things on LinkedIn. Um, an organization, if people are, are interested also in this interface between culture and uh, diversity, um, I've learned a lot from the from CETA, the Society for Intercultural Education, Training and Research. And they have chapters in, in many different countries. There's a CETA USA where it originated uh, in the 1970s. And there's in Europe, the CETA Europa and different countries have their own groups there. And most, um, many of the interculturalists are getting uh, getting into diversity more strongly. Um, and um, within Germany, where I'm active, we have a very uh, important lobby group called Charter der Vielfalt, which is Charter of Diversity, which is actually um, yeah, a group of companies, organizations, politicians who've signed up to this diversity. So I think those groups are very important. So oh, that's awesome. Well, we'll be uh, sure that, to link to those in the show. Yeah, notes. those are, those are interesting sources and that, um, that diversity charter in Germany, they also publish actually quite a lot of stuff uh, and some of it's in English, not everything um, may be interesting for your, um, for our listeners here. Um, so I, when I find things, I post them on LinkedIn and I found that actually to be, uh, quite an interesting forum for mm-hmm. I, I've written a few articles probably I'll write some more um, so that would be and I welcome people to contact, uh, contact yeah people. I agree LinkedIn if you start following people in the diversity spaces and just get that slow trickle in your feed yeah. of articles of ideas um, yeah. there's no shortage of content there for sure so we'll be sure to link LinkedIn profile to follow you there and some of the other references you had thanks so much Robert for being on the show it was a thrill to get to know you today thanks a lot all the very best bye-bye I appreciate you listening to this episode. If you like this podcast, the best way you can be an ally is to write a review on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Every review helps other allies find us. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together as allies.